Cheers to episode 19. Cheers. Cheers to episode 19. Water. Water. Wow, we all had a rough weekend. I'm drinking strawberry lemonade, so I can't talk much. That sounds delicious. Sounds really good. It is fantastic. So we are recording episode 19 at 7.31 p.m. on Tuesday, May 4th, 2021. And I'm not going to say the cheesy joke because I don't watch Star Wars, but go ahead, Alex. May the 4th be with you. (laughs) Oh, man, I felt nerdy just listening to that. It's a great series, an all-time classic. And if you don't like it, that's okay. Did either of you guys watch The Mandalorian today to celebrate? No, I did not. A new Star Wars show actually came out today. But it's animated, so it's not really my thing. But some people out there really enjoy that stuff. Evan does. No, I don't think Evan's that guy. I'll probably watch it eventually, but I'm not leaving this podcast to go watch it right now. It's you know on what? the top of my priority list. I just moved it to the top of my priority list. After this show, I'm watching it. Wow. Well, other than that, nerdy watching, what's new with you guys? Week recap. Evan, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Why not? Okay. Uh, let's see. This weekend, went down to Sylvania for a baseball tournament, you know, coaching, and uh, we got butts handed to us. Mm. Like, we lost the first game by three touchdowns. Um, not good. Fields? No, not good. Um, fields were actually super nice, like, how bad we played. Like, we didn't deserve to be on these nice fields. <laughs> It was like, okay, guys, you need to leave. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's a long season, long summer. Got a bunch of time to improve. And then golf last night. Recap in men's league. Um, my partner and I, we golfed by ourselves. We didn't face anybody because they didn't show up. Um, they were scared. had a quiet round. Um, I shot under my handicap. I only shot six over. I was pretty pleased. Solid day. Wow. Great weekend. It sounds like nice that three touchdown loss in baseball yeah i wouldn't say it was a great weekend you know it was a home home weekend just another average weekend a lot of driving yeah 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 ohio is uh ways away well oh i was thinking that when you said it was relatable when you said the team it's like they didn't deserve to be on that field that's how i feel when i golf on courses that are considered good it's like i just don't need to be here um the maintenance men need a bump in their salary that week after I leave a course with all the beaver pelts they got to replace. So I can I can relate to that. Different sport, but same feeling. Alex, did you think about what uh what's new with you this week? I did. So, so I, you didn't uh, listen to Evan at all? I listened to him, and it sparked my memory of what I did this weekend. Oh. I'm getting old, bad memory. Hmm. Um, I went to Michigan State, saw some people graduate. My sister also graduated, if I didn't say that, you know. Get in trouble. Might get killed. Uh, so yeah, saw some, watched some graduation on uh, on the computer, but I was on the campus for all the other activities. COVID. Yeah. And then I had a pretty casual Sunday just by myself. Got some McDonald's, you know, treated myself. Talk, talk more. And what, then what Monday, uh, golf. No, what'd you get at McDonald's? Oh, I got a Big Mac meal. Oh. Large Coke. Oh, a little McChicken on the side. Mm. Mm. No onions, of course, on the uh, Big Mac. Tasty. Then, uh, yeah. So then golf. I did have playing uh, opponents. We won sixteen and a half to thirteen and a half. Personally, I had some terrible duffs. It's not good, but overcame that. I shot a thirty-eight with a couple birdies. Not a big deal. To put myself, I think, back tied for first in the birdie race, which is really all I want to win this year. I just want to win the birdie race. So, yeah, it was a pretty good uh, Monday. And then on Thursday, I'm going to Las Vegas. So Vegas. My sister's graduation gift, I guess. I don't know. I know what they say about Vegas. What happens there stays there. Right. Except so for, you know, I don't even need to say it. Well, I won't be able to tell anybody next week when we record what I did. So I'm just telling you guys now I'm going to Vegas. I'm going to enjoy myself. Why won't you share with the listeners? Because what happens in Vegas, it stays. Except for, I don't know what you're trying to say. (laughs) Evan knows. Evan, do you know what I'm saying? 
Yeah, I know what you're saying. It's from a movie. It's yeah. from The Hangover. The Hurt. That comes back with you. Oh. Because that's a lifelong disease. Right. Right. So stay out of any brothels, please. No brothels for me. No. So. What about you? Me? Um, I was thinking of how to phrase this because it's been a recurring theme. I think um, like with updates, the washed up scale is uh, something that I invented when I was thinking for the show. And I would say some weekends of drinking in the past, I may have climbed up the, the washed up scale, like on the prices rate game, the Yoda Lehu, when he goes do 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 up the scale. That was me. I would say this weekend, I took a couple notches back on the washed up scale, kind of dug in, had two nights of drinking. Um, did not want to drink the second night, but I did. Uh, not that I'm a hero or anything. Not all heroes wear capes. It's huge for you, really. Yeah. You can thank me for my service later, but I pulled through. Um, I stuck to more beer this weekend. Got away from the liquor. Got away from the crazy stuff. Uh, I've heard Pat McAfee. Pat McAfee ended up in the Broad Ripple River once for the Colts because he drank a lot of tequila at the bar. And uh, I remember him saying that he got pulled into, I believe it was Ursay's office. I said, Pat, please lay off the hard stuff and just drink beers at the bar. And sometimes you just need to remember that advice. And you just knock back a couple Bud Lights. No free ads. Um, that would be a dream sponsorship one day for this show. Some Bud Lights. Because Bush Light, as Evan knows, is going out of stock. That's not true <laughs> at all. That's not. It never will die. Our recurring guest, Cody Wilkins, tried to tell us that Bush Light's <laughs> going to be out of business. So, so if well, anybody knows that that's really true, please let us know. So Evan can prepare. <laughs> Evan's uh, world yeah. would be turned upside down if that happened. Um, I probably won't drink it ever again. I was going to say, what, no. would, what would you uh, switch to? I think it would be Bud Light. Yeah, that's about it. It'd be devastating, really, for you. Yeah. The natural second choice, Bud Light. Um, but long story short, I think I'm less washed up than before, at least in this moment. And then my other bullet point I wrote down, two things about the warmer weather coming up. Got a wedding to go to this weekend. So summer wedding season has officially started for me. Uh, I only have uh, not, I had a couple last year, a couple family members got married last year. I think it's gonna be lighter this year, but looking forward to that. Uh, it's not gonna be that warm in Michigan. So it's not gonna feel like a summer wedding. But that's always a fun time. Get dressed up for something. I haven't dressed up in a long time because, like, COVID. But not a suit is, is fun. Can yeah. Look cool. Might go suit. Minute. Haven't decided yet. Been, been talking with the family members what the deal is there. Like, what are we thinking? Maybe some James Bond kind of outfit? No. When he, he wears a tuxedo. Exactly. No. <laughs> um, and then I wrote this down, as you guys saw on the show notes, probably what is that about? Shout out Cinco de Mayo um, at Butler, where I went to school. That was the biggest like party holiday of the year because we would graduate later than most schools. So you were still on campus for that. And it was just an all you can darty buffet for seniors on the knoll. Shout out the knoll. Those that know, know just two. Th imagine this like, so you have just two rows of houses here, senior houses. And in the middle, it's not a street. It's just a grass road. It's awesome. It's just all grass. So it's not a road. It's just grass. But it's like this. It's like there should be a road there, but they just filled it with grass. And then there's one sidewalk down the middle. And so everyone's lawns so are just touching. Courtyard. So all the lawns are just touching. And, and you just, just parks. walk outside and feet, like brightly colored shirts for the eye I can see. Didn't you have one of your more like regrettable things happen on Cinco de Mayo? Yeah, involved a tequila bottle. Um, see, it, but that all circles back to staying off the hard stuff and going Bud Lights. And I probably wouldn't have potentially spiked a, spiked a bottle and broke it and felt really bad. And to my defense, though. <laughs> Drunk Grant was like, this is a bad idea. So I like picked up a lot of the glass pieces without cutting myself. So um, recovered from that one nicely. But yeah, shout out to everyone. Uh, if you're at Butler, I don't know how it works with COVID this year, but you should be. If you're at Butler's campus and you're debating how hard you should go tomorrow or today when you're listening, if you're listening, go hard. Okay. If you can. Like because of COVID. But like go as hard as you can. Even if it's just and if the cops show up on the cop, another last thing, not that I don't care, but the cops so funny they would just ride around on segways down like the sidewalk of the grassy part. So like we were party, then segway like Paul Blart mall cops are just zipping down the sidewalk. That's all for me. I'm really fired up to talk about the lions, so I want to go to that next. And I can tell Alex is because he's wearing a lions hoodie. Am I? Yeah. Oh. So I'm now. I kind of need your guys' help of where we should start because I there's so many bullet points in our show doc about this. What do you think is the best way to do this, guys? I think we should just start. Personally, I think we should go grade off the top and then filter down from there. The grade. Yeah. All right. Evan, give us your draft grade for the Lions. Professor Cadmus. 
What's your grade? My draft grade for the Lions is B plus. Nice. Do you want me to explain why? No, nope, not yet. Just going straight grade. Let's go grade first. I kind of want to know. You you will know. Okay. Right? okay. <laughs> but we'll go grade first. B plus. Uh, a minus for me. I also had a B plus. Nice. So pretty much the same range. I yeah. just kind of grade on a curve, I guess. Yeah. I'm now, a teacher with the curve. Now, Evan, why the B plus? Um, they double dipped in the same position. It was needed. Um, and there was nothing really on here that was like sexy or stood out to where people giving grades or evaluating the team is going to be like, well, this person is going to be a dramatic impact for them. Um, I think they did this draft for a year, looking forward for years to come. Um, and and it looked like the first pick, it wasn't the flashy pick. It was just the right pick. Panay. Panay pasta. Me? Um, <laughs> I, guess, I guess my answer is I wrote down some words to describe the draft, like one phrase or one word. And I think that kind of goes into why I had it as an A-. minus. I wrote down discipline. That was a very disciplined draft. Good. Good value draft. I feel like on a lot of boards, a lot of places I read, we didn't do what people call reaching per se on most of our picks. We took guys that on most people's big boards were um, ranked higher than where they went. I mean, we got them at a good value. I would say an athletic draft, which I'll touch on later in the nitty gritty of the analysis section that people may like or dislike, but so fired up about the draft, I need to get into it. So athletic, remember that word. And then versatile. So I think those discipline, value, athletic, and versatile is how I put together the draft. And it feels like the dawning of a new decade where there's a, there's a shift in the mentality that regimes of the past, um, namely the Matt Millen era, we would go flashy to address a need. This year, we had the chance to go flashy to address a need. And we were disciplined enough to not do so. And we said, we're going to build this team from the inside out. I'm um, putting a lot of things together here, but the, the thing that I like that makes me comfortable and sleeps well at night is when I think I can see what the plan is in a front office, which will be a big theme later in the show, as I believe there's a team in the city that does not have a plan and does not know where they're going. Tigers. But this team, the Lions, I think has a plan. They want to build from the inside out. And that's clear. And I know the joke all, and was really annoying on social media, like, oh, they're getting guys that want to bite kneecaps. All right. Well, like, that joke has, like, never been funny, really. Maybe the first person that said that was, was funny to say that. But, like, that aside, there is some truth to it. It's not even really a joke because they want big uglies in the trenches that are going to beat people up. And they have a plan of how to win in the NFL. And that, this is their route. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, well, whatever. I agree wholeheartedly with what you said. Wow. Shocking. Doesn't always happen. But uh, number one thing um, w uh, that comes with my grade, so B plus, but I really think it has strong potential to be in the A to A plus range, okay. which you could say that about anyone. So class. it was like a, a nice final essay written, but they kind of miss some grammatical things and you think they can easily clean that up. Like if this yeah. is a rough draft, there's really a good chance at a, at a solid A. Now, I love that we build from the inside. As you said, so I was just looking at some, you know, great teams historically, and those teams win in the trenches usually. Who? So, I, and when I say historically, I really mean in my life of twenty four years. Okay. So, Patriots usually have strong lines, both defensively and offensively. No pushback there. The Steelers are usually pretty strong, at least on the defensive line, and have been very strong on the offensive. Or Seattle. The Ravens. Well, I guess Seattle would be the outlier. Recently, <laughs> Seattle's <laughs> offensive line, not great. But when they were winning, it was pretty simple. No, it wasn't. Defense. They're actually notorious for like taking guys that don't belong on the offensive line and somehow making it work because their quarterback is the best scrambling quarterback of like all time. Okay. Defensive line's pretty sad. And then... They won with their secondary. But that's... I don't want this to get distracted, but like the I The defensive I line on Seattle is... Is all right. Has been but historically... But they're like crazy. unit that was... That yes, them, Legion of Boom. Right. I watch. I watch the NFL. Yeah. Well, I'm, I had to double check because they're a good team and they have good lines. <laughs> Fine. I mean, when you think Seattle, do you think about dominant offensive and defensive lines? I didn't say dominant. I said they're solid in the. Trenches. I said dominant. No. Say it louder for the Sorry. people in the back. 
No. Okay. The Ravens, <laughs> you can't really argue this. I mean, they have multiple like Hall of Fame offensive line. Now we're back on the tracks. Defensive linemen, they're pretty solid there too. Yep. I mean, they're pretty much all good on defense usually. Name five of their songs. I'm just kidding. Okay. And then uh, I don't agree with this one, but I have it on my list. So, but I don't really know if this one's true. But you said it pre-show that they're like historically good team in our life. So I was just gonna ask you, what do you think about the Saints' offensive and defensive lines? Oh, as we sit here today, and we're talking like the last five years. I know they haven't won, but they should have been in a Super Bowl. Their offensive line is top five in the NFL right now, and their defensive line is disgusting. So disgusting for the good, like good, yeah, like Cam Jordan. Henderson. Yep. Sheldon yeah. Rankins. Henderson's gone. Anya Mata. Yeah. So I like the... the where'd he go? He got paid, right? Who? Cool. Yeah, went to the Bengals. No, he wears no gloves. And you don't see that often. Anyways. Great teams win in the trenches. And the Lions addressed that with their first three picks. You honestly could have just used this year's Super Bowl. Because Patrick Mahomes was neutralized by a great defensive line. And, and their the Bucks offensive, offensive line, line came to play. Yeah. Well, and the Chiefs' offensive line struggled mightily. Yes. And they lost. They had an injury, and it hurt them bad. A couple. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your team. No. But great teams win in the trenches. So I like that the Lions addressed that. And maybe D-tackle wasn't a position of need in you know fans' eyes and everyone else's eyes. What about your eyes? In my opinion, the D-tackles on the Lions last year were pretty not good. Um, you had a rookie. John Penasini was mm-hmm. like one of our better D tackles, and Danny Shelton. Yeah, no production there, so I I like addressing that. And I also heard today, like from a draft analyst, that like Ooh. it's hard to find Daniel Jeremiah. Oh, the best, not a one of the best. <laughs> that it's uh it's really hard to find good D tackles <laughs> after like. Really, he said after round one, you can find on some. Ryan Russillo show. I did. And you could find good ones in uh, round two, but then after that, they kind of And what do you off. say about offensive linemen? Not to stroke my own ego, but when he said that, it confirmed what I said during our mock draft, that offensive linemen are not deep in later rounds, and he confirmed that as well. So and you disagreed with that. On the so draft. it's... it's not to go back there, but... The trenches in the first two rounds are really, like, the most... They hit the most, and they uh, they don't have much upside after the second round. Mm-hmm. So I like that we address right. that. Well, hmm. I want to know then, we'll go Evan first. What, because B plus, so there were things that you didn't like, obviously. What were your dislikes from the draft then, Evan? Uh, I didn't like trading up later in the draft when you're limited draft capital mm-hmm. um, for a linebacker that is still learning the position. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I guess, you, you know, it's just like personal preference. Defensive tackle isn't a sexy pick, and that second round pick. There are some players that have fallen that you could see, like at the linebacker or safety position, they're taken. And I understand why they took defensive tackle. Say their names. And then, like I said earlier, B plus just because. I mean, Mo Reagan, JOK. Yeah. Um, that was my. Um, and then we just didn't have an. That was my enough big picks to deserve an A grade. Mm-hmm. The volume. We missed out on the volume of the draft. Because I was looking at some recaps, and like some teams had a million picks. And it was like, whoa, we did not nearly have that many. You're going to thank Bobby Quinn for that. Well, so then I guess, I mean, you you may have touched it a little bit. But then what were you, like your big likes that vaulted into the B-plus grade? Going with Sewell at seven. And then now there's reports coming out that I heard today that the Lions were going to trade back at seven no matter what, unless Sewell fell to him. Some people say we don't need the help on the offensive line because it was like kind of solid last year. It has been solid. We have some nice pieces. But like you guys said, you build from up front. And when this team's rebuilding, it never hurts to have a really, really good offensive line in the NFL. And the Lions have never done that. They've always drafted the flashy players and try to put together an offensive line. And like Bob Quinn tried to do, he tried to sign offensive linemen, but they were on their back half of their careers and it didn't work out. He paid $10 million for the Eagles backup that we have to stick with right now. Um, I think drafting prospects is the best way to go for the offensive line. Yeah, I can't think of a time in our lives, like coherent lives and memories, where we had a dominant, we were, our offensive line was considered dominant in the NFL. Like, multi, like three plus guys that were considered very good at the position. And I think... We have potential for that now. I'm not saying we're there yet, but I'm saying I wouldn't stun me if a couple of years we were considered that. Not Colts level, but like 
up in that tier. Alex, what were your biggest gripes with the draft? Gripes with the draft, then. I didn't really have many. Then why isn't it an A plus? Well, one, um, right. It's not. <laughs> it's not anyone's fault. We just didn't have very many picks, so maybe. Oh, well, it is someone's fault, but that. That's anyone fine. in the current staff's fault. I mean, they could have traded down, maybe tried to acquire more picks, but I also think after doing our own full draft, that after the fifth, there's not much that you're like super excited about. So I don't mind being done after basically the fourth round. But only other real gripe was that maybe I would have wanted to take a wide receiver really er, a little earlier. I didn't. I don't love uh, Saint Brown from USC. I don't think he's super flashy. You like I'll, him? We'll get to it. Yeah, let's wait till we get to the end of the We'll get players. to it. I mean, I don't think he's a bad player, but I thought there were better receivers. I will stay big picture class. before get you worked up, and I have to push back. Deep class, and maybe I would have wanted to take one a little earlier. I really wanted. Yeah, what, who did you I really want? want well, this is going to have pushback because he's a little guy, but I was I was in love with Rondell Moore. Thought maybe he could really help this offense, give it some explosiveness. But other than that, I mean, I'm not complaining with the receiver we got because from for where we got him, it made sense, and I don't think the Lions really reached it all anywhere, like you said. But maybe I would have taken a receiver earlier to have a receiver with maybe more upside. My question is, so receiver, so, but not... You weren't one of those crazies. Well, I'm not. I shouldn't say crazy because like high school Grant would have won wideout in the first round, but you're not like one of those guys that wanted the first pick to be a wideout. No, and I think you made that clear. You're no. pretty steady on that the whole time. No receiver in the first. I was thinking, you know, second, maybe the second. Did we? We had two second rounds, or two? We had two thirds. No, two fourths. Two fourths. Yeah, we didn't have two thirds. Two thirds. Oh, two thirds as well. Yeah. We had more picks than I thought at the end of the day, but yes. I would have liked one like with the first pick in the Thirds. third, maybe. Okay. Fair. Or maybe trading one of our fourths and a sixth and moving up to the second. Surprisingly enough, I guess you in a transitions because you signaled the wide receiver group as as where you're kind of nervous about. To me, do you guys feel like that the linebacking core in the safety position kind of didn't really go addressed in this draft? And I feel like they're pretty weak still. I think the Purdue linebacker can potentially start on our bad defense like right away. So in that regard, I think they addressed it. But he ain't starting day one, I'll tell you that. He could. He's not. Do you know the linebackers that the Lions he has? Is, he's not started. He's, he's going to be started. a special I think he could compete. You will see him on started. punt and punt return. He could compete to play. Yeah, I see the linebacker in class. Who did, you, his job. <laughs> who did you want? I'm not saying I wanted someone. I'm just saying that's why I didn't get the best grade. I'm I'm just I'm nitpicking. I think it was a good draft, but I'm saying you can't fix all the lines. Well, I will say I wanted draft. Jabril Cox. I did, and there was a chance to get him. And I wanted Jeremiah Wusu Cormo, and there was a chance to get him. There was a heart condition, that and I also wanted. That's true. There there is medical issues, but you never know what those. Um, I wanted Trevon Mulrick. We didn't get him, and I'm just I'm, I'm not I'm not nitpicking per se but i am because you have to find some things you didn't like and i mean evan what i mean don't don't you look at the linebacking safety groups and you're like well there there needs there's some work that needs to be done there yes because you you sign reeves maven for a one-year deal basically like a trial for this staff you bring in alex elzone um yeah, and i think that was just because he played under or with the two coaches the defense coordinator and campbell um, Jelani Tavai, everybody knows how bad he is. And so drafting a late round kid that is still raw from Purdue isn't fixing the position. I don't think it's um, fixing either. And like Will Will Harris was a was a high capital draft pick, so I'm not right. so I'm not in there. I'm not gonna get it specific. Well, I think I can actually have it as the right pick. Yeah, he was a third round draft pick in twenty nineteen, so still young and still has a chance to be good. Um, and then Tracy Walker was a third round pick the year before. So you'd like those two guys to grow with our new defensive coordinator who specializes in the secondary. So maybe that's, that's another thing too, where they're like, Hey, we have a secondaries, uh, guru as our defensive coordinator. And we have two high capital safety draft picks who have good athletic scores and maybe they'll be okay. One thing I wanted to get to, I, I mentioned athletic earlier. I don't know if you guys saw any of this. I saw it on our, like, um, accounts Twitter account. I'd never heard of this. I'm going to give the credit where it's due. The guy's name is Kent Lee Platt. At, his at is Math Bomb. And it's like an NFL statistics heavy thing. 
He has this system called a relative athletic score, RAS. I'm not sure if he does all the grading, but he like posts all the tweets of it. And it basically takes into account a bunch of testing numbers and tells you how athletic the player is for their position and tells you historically how good they are. That's interesting. And this draft is the first one in decades where the average player drafted by the Lions was an eight or higher. And it is alarming. I went back through old drafts and you look, and I'm not saying how athletic you are is everything, but you look at bus picks and you look at good picks. And a lot of the guys are, they were, he color codes it red, yellow, green, like, you know, bad to good. And the reds were pretty much all bust. Like July and Tavai was a two out of the 10 athletic wise. And you can kind of see that sometimes when he plays. And just to go quickly, quickly through, Panega was a nine, Levi, on, well, one thing about the Lions draft too is the names are impossible, so I'm just going to stick with Levi O. 8.73, Aleem McNeil, 8.53, Ify Melifanu, 9.69, awesome. Amon St. Brown, 7.14, Derek Barnes, 8.42, and then our, our running back was a 2.28 in, in the seventh. So just interesting. Um, it's not everything, but that's my hint to athletic. There's actual evidence to back it up. And the reason that the, the big guys tested so well is because their like lateral quickness and like speed and acceleration is like very good. So for being big, they're not like um they're not like slow moving guys. They they're, they're, they can be quick, and that's why they're also versatile in schemes as well. So that was a big thing I heard. Even Brad Holmes talk about was like the first he liked the versatility of all the guys they got. Like he doesn't think Aleem McNeil will just be your standard nose tackle. He doesn't think Ify Melifonwu will just be a lanky press corner. He thinks they can do multiple things. So I like that because past regimes haven't really drafted the most athletic guys. And uh, I don't know. I just like I like having athletic guys. Can't disagree with that at all. Hearing that July and Tobias is a two. Very low. You would. And I might have just been biased off that, but. Based on that alone, I feel great about the draft now. If you guys want to know, too, well, since we're on the Twitter stats, let's see how it backs up with you guys. Um, this is from, I about this on part of my take, too. Renee Bugner at rmbwcv what a handle she compiled 18 evaluations of gpa grades for drafts so like what we said basically the grades and we were the eighth best draft in the nfl according to 18 different um you know so like mel kuyper sources of all kuyper didn't love us of all the sites so i mean here's a here's a b that's not awful but so eighth um and our gpa that you went gpa was 3.47. So pretty more done with, I was a little bit higher. You guys are probably right there, B, B plus based on the, uh, the scale. So right in that range. Now it hurts. I think we can all agree. The Bears were voted the best draft in the old NFL with a 3.99 GPA, mainly because they went and got their guy. But then again, they got their guy in Trubisky and it didn't work out. But deep down, I think Justin Fields will be better. So that stinks. Um, but it's nice to be in the top 10. I mean, I know like, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. The grades, like grades are fun to look back on. You never know how good your draft will be. But it's nice to be in the top 10. I think we can all agree with that. It feels good. It's early to tell. I mean, you got to see it on the field before you can really give it a grade. Bears could end up having the worst draft, and we have no idea. So we'll see. Was there any, before we get to individual guys, was there any surprises that you guys had from the draft, uh, line specific? I was a little surprised we took a running back in the last round, but then again, it's the last round and you're just taking a flyer, so I'm not shocked, but it's a little surprising, I guess. I'm surprised, like I said earlier, I'm surprised that we moved up in the draft when we were limited on picks and are giving capital away for next year, but other than that, nah. I think the only surprise for me was passing on JOK and Trevon Moerg when they were both there. That I was like, well, if one slides, we're going to take either. They both were there, and we passed on both. So who knows deep down what will happen. But I will say, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying in the moment, I was surprised they did not take one of those guys. It makes more sense knowing that the health stuff later, but oh well. So now what I want to do, because the best thing, I, I think the most fun thing and irresponsible thing is to throw lofty player comparisons on individual players in the draft. And this will also be our chance for if you want, if you have anything on any of the guys individually, we'll go down the row, um, starting from the, the top pick to the last and hop in with like things you like or dislike or just your straight player comp if you have one. And it's all right if you don't have them for everyone, but we'll just go through and we'll go in the circles. So it'll go Alex, Evan, and me. Um, so player comps or any notes 
Panay Sewell, what do you think? Joe Thomas. Wow. High upside. Joe guy. Thomas. Wow. Not as big, but I mean, in terms of production, I expect him to be that good. All right. So a Hof Lyman. Yeah. I would say, okay, so Hope. if we're going for a whole player, come on, go Tyron Smith. Cowboys, right? Yeah, Cowboys left tackle played on the dominant offensive line. He's kind of one of the known names for that offensive line group. For me, I'm thinking Trent Williams. Just signed a massive deal with the Niners. Um, I hope he's better. I mean, he was like great as the best offensive lineman in football last year. So if he's better than that, then that's awesome. He'll be the best lineman in football. <laughs> <All of fame. laughs> um, but I think that basically means that our expectations, well, not expectations. Well, mine is, yeah. I want he has to be a top ten tackle in this league at some point in his career. I hope so. So, I don't know. You know, I hope the team's success is better than Joe Thomas's in Cleveland. But it'd be nice if he was that player. Um, yeah, like that one's not as not as hard because like he's a surefire, you know, whatever top top pick. Now Levi, I'm gonna try to say his name at least once. Levi Anzarecki. I think the W is silent there. What do you guys see him as for the Lions? And you can get into this is interesting too, where Evan thinks about the scheme fit. You know, how does he fit in our defense, et cetera? And who do you think he could be like in the NFL? What do you think, Alex? You look stumped on this one. I was pretty stumped. Let's go Evan first. It's been punted to you. Okay, so scheme fit. I, I think he fits our scheme. Um, I think they say he's more of a disruptor. And his quote, um, you're going to have to go look it up, is yeah. legendary. Yeah. Um, and I think he's a Dan Campbell guy. I would say he's a bigger version of like Sue if he plays to that potential. Wow. That's pretty I mean, big. I mean if he I mean if he talks the way that he has to back it up and back it up, then you're comparing him to Sue the way that Sue was on the lines. Yeah. I would love that. Hopefully less fifteen yarders, but uh yeah, sign me up for another Sue. You know, if he's stuck on Aaron Rodgers leg, I wouldn't if he's still in the NFC North. Whoa. Oh, job. Um, for me, so this one I actually did the responsible thing and put a low end and a high end. I think low end, um, now, at low end I put Mo Hurst. Played at Michigan, similar um, height and weight, which is like the main basis when I make comps. I want to make sure the height and weight are similar because if they're the same body type, you can kind of see it. Um, he did get released by the Raiders, I believe, but it was shocking because he wasn't bad. He was like a top 25. I don't think he signed yet. D lineman. Um, so something going on there. High end, this would be like if this was the greatest pick, it'd be Gray Jarrett of the Atlanta Falcons. He is like a premier disruptor. And if you ever watch him, he gets off the ball so fast, which is what they want Levi O to do. I guess the Levi, uh, his um, calling card is that he is he's, he's slimmer than a lot of interior defensive linemen. That's why I think the Lions think he's versatile. I guess he has heavy hands, though. Like Evan said, disruptor, heavy hands. Traits that you want to hear when when talking about a guy. So hopefully he can get off the. I mean, there's that the clip of him just shucking that Colorado Buffalo player to the side, and then like it was almost like a mini Jadavian Clowney play where he just shoved the center to the side and made the tackle. If he does that at all in the NFL, I will be definitely on the uh, Levi train. Alex, has any of that given you a thought? Yes. Okay. My cop is Sheldon Richardson. Hmm. Guy. Did you get that from someone? Because I saw that today. I did, but oh. I, I did deeper research to see if, you know, it's comparable, and it, it is. The guy made great points. And then I'm looking at the stats of Sheldon Richardson. He won Rookie of the Year. That'd be awesome. Gets sacks, tackles for loss, big disruptor, gets in the backfield. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be, like, best case scenario, though. I could easily see him being, like, uh, the Sean Hand. It's not extremely productive. All right. But let's hope for somewhere in the middle. I think um, I'll go Aleem McNeil now, the next pick. I'll start this one off. When I saw him, when I saw the draft, and I saw his highlights, I thought of one name and one name only. DJ Raji. Just reminds me of just a big bowling ball there in the middle. And I was like, yeah, he's like light on his feet. The other one that I wrote then that has Saints ties and the reason I thought of that is because like, a lot of our staff came from the Saints. Sheldon Rankins of the Saints is a very good interior lineman, nose tackle, similar heights, gets off the ball fast, 
this the lean guy really intrigues me because he is very athletic. He was gonna play baseball and just decided to bulk up to get like over three hundred pounds for this. So he's like very light on his feet, has great hand eye coordination, and I think he could be very interesting in this league. I don't wanna spoil it for later, um, but I also had Sheldon Rankins for his like ceiling. Nice. Um just so like you because he played for the Saints. Um but the uh, Floor, like the bottom, would be like a Nick Fairley because Nick Fairley was ginormous coming out of college, mm-hmm. and we just picked him just because he fell to us and he probably didn't know what to do. And he was like a one year, two year kind of guy, and he fell off the face of the earth. Yeah, yeah, he did not have a long year uh, last in the league. Hopefully, he's like the the Auburn guy yeah. that came out last year and went to Carolina Brown. That guy's awesome. Derek Brown. Yeah, hopefully he's more like Derek Brown from Auburn. Derek Brown. Yeah. Who the line should have drafted last year. Yeah. His ceiling is relatively high, just with size and athleticism. Okay. But I'm going to say he could be a more athletic, so probably even better, a more athletic Haloti Nada. All right. In the middle. Faster, better hands, but like big, big dude. Could get after it. Big dude. 300. He's a, he's a big. huge guy, can stuff the run. Maloney Nato was pretty good for the Lions. I just feel like Aleem's pad level is going to be awesome because he's like 6'2", and I feel like he's going to be able to get under some big offensive linemen. I don't know, but I hope that's the case. Um, he's a bowling ball. He was kind of hard to comp because there's not many of those guys that are that tall, which is worrisome, but also could be used to your advantage if you play it right. A lot of those guys are like, like Calais Campbell's like 6'7", 6'8". Like you he could easily flame out for Reed as well. All these guys could. They might just be able to put their helmet on, or hand on his helmet and like hold him off. You hope not. Hopefully his jump's better. No, the Eagles wanted him, so mm. must have been decent. Well, since I, I'll start. I'll keep the circle going this way then. Um, so Ify Melanfanwu, there's only this is one was the toughest one for me um, because I again said I have to go by height and weight, and there's not many six three corners in the NFL. No. So it makes you, it makes you think maybe one day he could be converted into a safety, but I don't I don't necessarily gonna bank on that. And so there's only one comp, and it definitely would be his ceiling. It'd be Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman is the only 6'3 corner that's worth anything in the NFL. There is one other one. Uh, I guess this would be his floor, maybe. Uh, Kevin King from the Packers. That could be his lower side. So we have two 6'3 guys. Um, Kevin King also has a bitter taste in his mouth because he didn't have a great NFC Championship game. But maybe we find a bully ball Richard Sherman or like a poor man's Richard Sherman. And I'm down for that. I really, I, we had a most excited, I'm most excited to watch him play. I know Panay's the obvious pick. But I really like tall corners. And this guy was locking up the ACC elites. Like, he didn't go against cookie-cutter wilds. He had Amari Rogers, Cornell Powell, Diami Brown. He faced Trevor Lawrence. He faced Sam Howell. This guy is battle-tested in the ACC. I know people don't think it's the strongest conference. But this guy had to play serious playmakers. And in his highlights, you notice him making, up, making a lot of plays on balls against those guys. So I like that. I don't have a player comp, um, but I think this is a trend going forward. Of just like big uh, athletic corners in the NFL. Yeah. Um, and I think they try to start it. Um, Amani Rawari is a little bit taller compared to some other corners. So, like, player comparison on the roster already. Um, and then I feel like he will potentially be like the, how do I put it, the slot or the field corner that's going up against the best. Uh, pass catcher, so he'll go up against like the athletic Travis Kelsey, or yeah. he'll go up against Kyle Pitts. Mm-hmm. And that situation where like the bigger pass catcher that we're seeing in the future trend, like that's somebody that has to like guard him. I like that. I like that a lot. He's gonna lock them down. <laughs> My uh, comparison is a six-two corner. So he's he's an inch taller than this guy, but uh, Namdi Asamoa, mm. if you guys remember him, he Namdi had, Asiago Cheese. He was yes. a, a big free agent signing to Philly that didn't work out. But when he was in Oakland, he was he had great ball skills. He had a year with eight interceptions. So athletic, tall corner who has good ball skills. I don't know if he's going to be much of a tackler, which Namdi Asamoa wasn't either, but. I think if he reaches that for a, what, fourth round pick? Third. Third. Second half of the third. Which is Basically important. The fourth. Your third's got to be decent. But I mean late third. Okay. Yeah, I think he could be, you know, 
Pro Bowl level. If he <laughs> develops, I think he's pretty raw. He's got a lot to learn. But I like the height and I like the size. He's not small. And his athletic score was the highest. He was in the nines because he's fast. He's not getting picked on over the top. He's explosive. Okay. Now, are you ready for this? Are you guys ready for this? Hope you're sitting down. I know you are because I'm watching you. It's going to blow you away. Who we found in the fourth round is our wide out. Wait till you hear what player this guy is. I'll give you one name that I came up with, and I'll give you a name that someone else smarter than me said. Okay. So Amon was St. Brown. He has football pedigree in his family. Equinemius is in the league. Played in Notre Dame. Amon was St. Brown is Robert Woods. And we got him in the fourth round of the NFL draft. I don't know when Robert Woods went, but he is. And I know what you're thinking, Alex. You're thinking that Robert Woods is a burner. Like, he's fast. And Amon doesn't look fast. Well, guess what? They ran the same exact 40-yard dash. 4-5-1. So they both ran that. So they both ran four or five ones. They both can play in the slot and out wide. And I'll tell you what, after watching St. Brown's highlight tapes, obviously highlights, not lowlights, this guy might be the best vertical seam route runner in the whole NFL. Not NFL, but I'm at college. Like, he was torching safeties over the top, and he is one of the better route runners, which is a huge thing in the NFL, is just being able to run good routes, snapping people off. Um, I like that he's basically been playing with a pro potential quarterback. So it's not going to be a new adjustment to have Jared Goff sling him the ball because Jared Goff is awesome. And I think it's going to be comfy for Jared Goff to have a Robert Woods-esque talent. And I'll tell you this, I'm, I would be stunned if he doesn't start in our, as our slot receiver week one. Like, I think he probably jumps Quintez on the depth chart. I, should, I mean, I can't say it for certain, but just from watching, I like this guy soon a lot. And then Greg Cosell, I believe is his name. Um, he does a lot of NFL scouting, well-trusted. I saw this from Tim 20 men because they have him rate the Lions draft as an outside observer. He compared Amon Ra St. Brown to Keenan Allen coming out of college. I saw that. So those two names, I'm very excited for this guy. Now, maybe hopefully Evan comes in and um, lowers the expectations so our listeners aren't drinking the Kool-Aid. But what do you think, Evan? No, he's not. No, um, I'm saving it for a little bit later. Um, I think we're going to get to it. Um, but I would say player comp, I would say Cooper Cup. Yeah. Just a true slot wide receiver. I mean, I'm a huge Cooper Cup fan. Um, so you just think of like the best slot wide receivers. And I feel like this kid could just jump in right away, like you said, and play and contribute right away for this team. And it's a position of need. And like you said, he's probably already at top of the depth chart. And we got him in the fourth round. Yeah, it's awesome. Alex. Now you bring us down. Well, I can't bring us down that much. The Lions wide receiving core is bad, and I do agree he's going to start probably from day one. And I have also read what clearly you were reading, and I've seen the Just Robert the Woods. Robert Woods is me. Robert Woods' Bleacher Report as well. That's from my brain. That's that's cool. I actually just went for my best. So he looks like him playing football. They're both West Coast guys. Well, and you're I, not the only one. And I just Googled Robert Woods' 40-yard time, and they're the same. I go, boom, yep. Done. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of, you know, you can say Robert Woods. receivers. They both run end. Amon ran a lot of end arounds too, which is a big staple of that Rams offense with Cooper Cup and Robert Woods. I think he's a. I think in terms of like newer guys to the league, Michael Pittman is a good comparison. They're both like they don't look fast, but then on Same the field, the, right? No. <laughs> so Michael Pittman went to USC. All right. Same school. Same comp. And then also, he could be a slower John Brown in the slot. Vertical guy, end-around guy, good route runner. I think he's taller than John Brown, and but John Brown's 40 was 4-3-4. So. I think his ceiling's higher than Danny Amendola's. I would I think say he's going to be better, better than Danny Amendola, but... Maybe. Danny Amendola was... I'm not... No to try, Danny Amendola was sick. Like, he's awesome. But I think Amonra, based on what I've seen, can be better. More vertical threat. I wish he was a little faster. That'd be my only. You mean pick. flashier, faster. He plays fast. I like a guy that has good hands and can, you know. He's good hands. That's great. Great you route running, and I don't want drops, so I'm good with that. But I, he's not. To me, he doesn't look explosive, like jump off the page, burner speed. No, and that's why he got him in the fourth. Right, but you know he could be good. He'll start. Lions receivers are bad. Ooh. Quintez Cephas runs like a 4-6. And St. Brown's good. Let's just not forget that. We'll see. We will see. So these last two I don't have as much on. I, I struggle with Derek Barnes as well. Um, quite a bit. Because So the, the, the lowdown on this guy, he was an edge rusher. And I was like, all right, I'm going to play linebacker now. Not as crazy. 
briefly, not derail, but that there, the fact that there was a quarterback from North Carolina, Chaz Surratt, who switched to linebacker and then got drafted in like either the second or third round is bananas. That you went to college as a quarterback, beefed up, played linebacker because Sam Howell was there, and then you got drafted that high as a linebacker. That's stunning. Anyways, so that basically happened for Derek Barnes, but on a much lesser scale. He went from edge rusher to linebacker, which naturally makes you think he'd be using the NFL as like a stand-up edge rusher, but I don't think that's his thing. I think he could be good as an inside linebacker. He's I don't think he's good at pass coverage from what I've read. And as on his highlight tape, there's no pass coverage highlights. So I was thinking like best case scenario, um, like a Danny Trevathan from the Bears, like a not not your alpha middle linebacker, but like a solid Robin, you know, like um, you're not Roquan Smith, but like you're flying around making tackles. And then his peak, his his uh, if we just again hit the lottery, Levante David potentially for the <laughs> Bucks, a uh, great alpha, a great blitzer can get to the quarterback, but not necessarily a premier pass coverage guy. So that's not your strength, but your strength then is rushing the passer, which he used to do. So, or blitzing. Maybe a Devin Bush too. Who knows? Poor man. Sure. Um, I mean, it's hard with the player comp because now he's you know, an edge rusher, so he's kind of an easier position. And then he's moving the middle linebacker, which I think that's where he'll have to play because he's not fast enough to be on the outside. Um, but if we run a 3-4 defense, which I don't think we will, he could be a stand-up edge rusher like you said. Almost sounds like he's just a bigger version of Jared Davis, unfortunately, to where he's like a run stopper, struggles a little bit in pass coverage, and hopefully they don't force him to have to do pass coverage. Like the last coaching staff forced Jared Davis to pass coverage, but Jared Davis was better at blitzing and coming off the edge and just playing downhill. And so maybe this kid will be in on like third down packages or like goal line situations because he's a bigger body. I'd like that. Third down, rush the passer specialist. And hopefully he has better instincts yeah. than Jared Davis. Because then that would make him better <laughs> if he just read the play better. Now, I think he's one of the Bobby Wagner? players that has like a reasonably high floor and a pretty low ceiling. Like I don't right. think he can be terrible, but I don't think he can be like Hall of Fame good. I don't think he's like ever gonna be Levante David. Ray Lewis? No. Okay. <laughs> no, I think like a uh a poor man's Joe Schobert is mm. like what he could be. Joe Schobert. He was a, he was a late round pick too. He's not known for great coverage skills, but I mean he knows where to be. He stuffs to run. He's he, awesome. He's a smart guy. He's really good. And at he he sketched out a role for him and himself in the NFL, and he's a pretty solid linebacker. And I think if if he reaches that level, that, I mean that's a fantastic pick because I mean he's a he's an everyday starter. Yeah. So Derek Barnes, last one. Jamar Jefferson. So two parter here. I have I didn't even do research for this one. I just saw him play. I'm like, oh, kind of reminds me of that guy. Not saying I'll get to this. And then two, I have a quote from an anonymous scout that I read in the article that's put me in my chair, knocked me back. So one, my comp is Chase Edmonds, just a kind of bursty lateral guy, similar height to him, pretty quick. Now what I read, and I'm, I wouldn't be, I'd find if you got Chase Edmonds comp in the seventh round, a good special teams guy, all day. Now. The reason I think we took him is because I think there was some buzz in the scouting circles. One anonymous scout from an AFC team, I believe, because the way he phrased it, you'll understand. He said, I would not be surprised. Oh, he said, this guy will get drafted, go to a team, and in year two, he'll rush for 900 yards and score seven touchdowns for an NFC team. That's right? awfully he, specific. He said, write that down. He told <laughs> a guy to write that down, 900 yards, seven touchdowns. I go, okay, well, one, that's probably not happening in Detroit because we have two good running backs in front of him. But, like, if that is what this guy saw on tape, then I am down for that as a seventh round pick. But I don't think it's going to happen. But Chase Edmonds, though, that'd be cool. I would say I got the West Coast five. He's from Oregon State, correct? Yeah, Pac 12 heavy draft for us. That should be said as well. Brad Holmes, West Coast guy. Mm -hmm. um, I would have to say he kind of just Javid best. Okay. You know, he seems like athletic where you can get those bursts out of him. But I don't know, being a late-round pick, is he going to be able to last in the NFL because you're just going to get buried in the depth chart. And maybe this scout that you found knows something that everybody else doesn't know. But I would say Java Best, you know. he Java Best has one of the best runs in the last 10 years for the Lions history. So Would have been a Hall of Famer without a turf toe. <laughs> just kidding, but that did suck. Alex, you're, you're looking deep here. You're trying to find the article I read. I know you are. 
I was just trying to fact check you. Yes, but I didn't find it. I think he could be a his low end is like a, the current bad carry on Johnson kind of style, and then high end, not as beefy, but like breakaway, like break tackles. Because I, I watched a little bit of his highlights. He, he breaks tackles. He stays on his feet. Maybe Jay and Jaye. I could see it. This guy's skinny. You know that, right? He's small. I'm not saying I'm not going for like height weight comparison here. I'm just going for production comparison. And I think, you know, if he gets a bunch of carries, he could have like two good seasons and then flame out. I saw him on the spot, Theo Riddick. And I'd be cool with that replacement. I don't think he's as explosive as like a Theo Riddick or Chase Edmonds based on what I saw, but maybe. He moves laterally very well. And I think he catches all right. We'll see if he even makes the team, honestly. I don't know if he will. You have three running backs and he's probably a practice squad guy. You're not carrying four running backs. Special teams Sundays. hero. So those are the players. Um, we can do our last kind of quick hitters here. The draft. The only thing I had to mention is that the social clip that came out, I thought was one of the funniest things I saw. And I didn't see it initially. And I watched it back after our live stream. Shout out our live stream. But I watched back the clip of full volume. The scene of Brad. So Brad Holmes talking to Panay first. Like a, a, he may have called him big man or whatever. Like, oh, we're so happy to have you. Hands it to Coach Campbell. Coach Campbell, classic, hey, big man, like, super excited to have you in Detroit, blah, blah, that good stuff. And then Brad, and then Dan does the right thing, and he says, all right, now talk to our owner, Mrs. Sheila Fordham. And Sheila Fordham grabs the phone, and she's, like, pretty soft-spoken. Like, she's not um, the loudest person, and she's trying to talk to Panay, and Brad Holmes just starts wooing twice, right, like, in her ear, and you can see her, like, start off. He's like, woo, woo. And then he goes over to that table and smacks it. And I had to rewind it twice. I was like, what just flew off the table? Like, is that a cord? He smacked the table so hard that a pen shot in the air above his head. Twice. <laughs> smacked it that hard twice that he got a pen to jump off of a table that landed above <laughs> his head as Sheila Forham is trying to talk to Panay in, like, the nicest grandma voice. And he is just, I mean, I, like, I get you're fired up, but, like, maybe just, like, phone etiquette wait till the phone's hung up i don't know like it was so funny i'm i love that he was fired up it was just comical to watch i don't know if you guys like thought about that in depth like i did but it was just hilarious two things uh one just to go back to jamar jefferson really quick because you called me out for height and weight jay Ajayi is 5'11, 220 and jamar jefferson is 510 220 so all right pretty spot on if we're asking but to the video, sorry that I had to bring that up. You're not. No, I'm not. The video, I actually, like, yes, like, you saw last year, Bob Quinn got all excited about Jeff Okuda. But seeing Brad Holmes, like, show that much emotion when we haven't really seen that much from him, I thought it was awesome. I laughed a lot, and I was excited that he must think we just got, like, the greatest NFL player of all time, and he was jacked up and fired up. And I think that's good for – uh Detroit Lions fans, I think it should get you going. It's not even that funny. It's just awesome. It's a little funny. Maybe like, it is a little funny, but like, I like that he's excited. It's a little funny because he's a little fangirl, like cheering so loud and proudly. But this is his first pick as a GM. And it's like one of the things, like, personally, he probably doesn't want to mess it up. He wants that first pick to be so correct. And if he gets his guy, then you have to be pumped for him and for the Lions. Yeah, I think uh, what I want to know, which we'll never know, which sucks, is he said in his post, post-presser post of day one that there was three guys they would have taken at seven, but he would not, even though the pick had been made, he wouldn't tell anyone what the other two players were. And my small brain, or worried brain, just wants to know who they were. It doesn't matter. We have Panay. We are Panay guys now, but I, just, I would love to know deep down who were the other two guys he would have taken there. I don't need to know. I would love to know. I think we made the right pick. Kyle Pitts and Jamar Chase, I bet. Probably. Trevor Lawrence. Uh, maybe, yeah. I don't. It doesn't matter. It really is irrelevant. No, but well, I want, didn't have an I'm option to well, take no. those guys, so it does not matter. You, what's your guys's um? Any other draft takeaways before we move on in the show? I was surprised the Bears moved up for Justin Fields. Oh, national. Kind of, I, I thought we were going to say that, but I'm just going to say it now. The most excited player I'm ready for for the Lions is Saint Um, the wide receiver. Yes. Um. It's some of the people out there. Uh, there's a national mock drafts, 
national NFL scouting on Instagram that I follow mm-hmm. had him graded as the 46th best player in the draft. Wow. And this is a former NFL executive that just does this on his own time. Um, and I know JT Daniels, he played quarterback for him, but he has no rooting interest for him besides like his friend. He's at Georgia now. He said it was the steal, the draft of getting St. Brown in the fourth round. And this is a guy that USC threw the ball a lot. He's a versatile route runner. Can run everything. He's not just a one trick pony. He's not just going to run go routes. And so I feel like this kid's going to be like a wide receiver that you're going to fall in love with. So he's going to replace Marvin Jones. So he's not going to replace Kenny Galladay. It's a different position, right. but he's just going to step in Marvin Jones' shoes and fill it right away. Tyrell Williams will be Kenny Galladay. You just sparked my memory for another player comp for him. Yeah. Another USC guy, Juju. I think, you know, they could be pretty comparable. And everyone loved him until he sucked. My height and weight thing just goes, like, Juju's massive. He's not that big. He's built. He's strong, but he's not, like, overly tall. He's not a Tyrell Williams six foot four wide receiver. I can look at his height and weight up again. And no, but even if they're close, that. like, like, J, like uh, Juju's, like, built. Uh, but that's awesome. And wow, that JT Daniels is pumping the Lions tires on uh, social media. I think that. everyone on the in the Lions faithful likes this pick so much because it's the flashy pick and it's a guy that is going to touch the ball, and that's why you're excited about it. Like it's easy to say but it was like a it was him a, is like he, a, like he's the best because you're going to see him. And he's but it start. wasn't the flashy pick. A receiver at any point is like something you can like be like, oh yeah, he's going to be really good. Kenny no. Galladay was a third round pick. Wasn't flashy. It doesn't need to be flashy. I'm just saying he's going to touch the ball, mm-hmm. so automatically you're going to be like, yeah, like he's going to be really good. You might not even notice Wrong. if you're not a diehard. I've like, never even thought about. Guy. I've never even thought about like the aspect of him being a skill player. That I like him a lot. Okay. Okay. Well, last year everyone was pumping the tires of Quintez Cephas. You saw how that. I did not. I didn't say you. You but said everyone. A lot of writers. <laughs> a lot of. Detroit media outlets were talking about how Quintez Cephas is going to be the third receiver. And that so I watched happened. him play games because they play Michigan every year, and I didn't, he didn't stand out to me. Slow. Yeah. So but I like Amonra, St. Brown. So we'll I'll, I will piggyback off that as my last thing. We'll see. All right. Speaking of the colleges, Michigan, Michigan State, brain dump is what I call it. Because basically we've been kind of – We've been busy with uh, draft stuff. We kind of been, oh, and Evan just sat in his chair. He is pumped for this. We've basically been punting a lot of Michigan, Michigan State stuff, kind of little things here and there that have been happening, and we kind of need to just get it all off our brain, you know, because that's what, hence the brain dump. So this, I would say, can go any direction. You can throw darts at the wall. We can even go in a circle if you want and just piggyback like, oh, yep, yeah, I, I think this about this, and then move on. And maybe we'll find a heated argument somewhere in the middle as two Michigan State fans and one Michigan, but... I don't know. I'll get off my chest. I don't really, as a Michigan fan, I don't think it's like cute or funny to make fun of Michigan State for not having someone drafted since we just talked about the draft. Who cares? Like, I've never been a college fan that cares that much about, like, I, I like to see Michigan guys succeed in the NFL, but I don't like freak out about, I like how they do in the NFL. I know it's big for recruiting and pro, and like, you need that in your program, but like, I don't freak out. If, like, if Jalen Mayfield didn't go or Quiddy Payton go in the first round, I wouldn't be like, Losing sleep at night. I care more about like the team that's there. On that note, I agree. It doesn't. I mean, it matters for but recruiting. It, yeah, but it doesn't. At one year, when you've done it for eighty years, I'm not, I'm not like losing sleep over it by any means. And also, <laughs> if we're just doing this Michigan Michigan State dump, the Michigan assistant coach tweeting about Michigan State not having a player drafted, I found comical. Because if you're gonna talk about that and you're so much better and you have draft picks and all this. You'd think Michigan would have won last year with all their picks this year, but they didn't. So that was a bonehead tweet by that guy. And I hope it doesn't bite him in the butt, but I hope it does. I agree. I haven't just had a massive chop. <laughs> um, staying on the football topic, Michigan's spring game was probably a while ago and we didn't really talk about it. But I never knew that it wasn't televised until probably an hour and 14 minutes ago. Um, and I think there's a reason why I'd be upset if I was in Michigan first, because you are investing into this program and you want to see product on the field get better based off of last year. The product was terrible and probably one of the worst teams that Michigan has seen in a while. And so you want to see the product get better. You brought in this new shiny toy and JJ McCarthy did the right to that position. 
and he's not getting seen. He's an early enrollee. He was the number one talking point on ESPN and all the recruiting boards. And then now, as a Michigan fan, you haven't even got to see him in person in forever. Don't even get to see him on TV. And this is, I think, Jim's way of hiding of how far this program is falling off underneath him. He doesn't want the national media to see inside the program of how bad they are getting and they're not getting better. Wow. Otherwise, what good, what bad would it hurt to show your team of, even if there's somewhat satisfaction there? Michigan State held a practice for our spring game just so that we would be on TV, just so Mel Tucker would be shown on TV. And that was his first spring game. And we didn't have the numbers enough to scrimmage each other. All we had to do was run a practice. And so I think it's Michigan. And if I was a Michigan fan, I'd be outraged. The spring game is something to look forward to, something promising to look forward to in the fall. And Jim Harbaugh said, no, none of that. He did. A big, kind of like a middle finger towards the Michigan fans. Well, that was aggressive. I agree. A little bit. It's a bad look. To me, uh, my point of view, I've gone, I've gone back and forth on it, so I see both sides. Like, I don't think you guys are crazy for saying that. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the break from it because last year was so frustrating. And I've also been very frustrated in the past when they have been the most loud team in the offseason. You know, going overseas, satellite camps that were uh, drawing buzz, Harbaugh chirping college coaches on Twitter. Now, maybe I should want that back because that's when they were more, uh, a little bit more competitive, I guess, in those seasons. But it was just annoying when we were like, when uh, the program, we, whatever you want to call it, was like the, the talk of the offseason, doing all these things, hosting, signing with the stars, with Migos, like, and the, and the results have never been there yet to that level. I don't hate to just, let's all take a step back and um, relax Seeing a spring game would be nice, but then also you're kind of glad because like I would just jump to so many conclusions. So I, I see both. At the same time, it's not like they're dead silent. Like I wrote down some things about the football program that Jim Harbaugh and coaches go on their like university uh, run podcast. So it's like kind of like I don't want to say cookie cutter interviews, but basically like they're not going to be asked the toughest questions. So I don't know. I can see both. Like I, I think they just want to get things right internally. I hope it's not the classic like. Oh, we don't want to reveal our depth chart stuff because that's just dumb. Like, who cares who's starting? The other team's not going to – the first team that you play the year is not going to be um, at a disadvantage because they didn't see your spring game or they didn't – they don't know who's starting. Like, it's college football. Let everyone know who's playing. So, I hope it's not that. I hope it's just like, you know what? They sat there. There's so many new coaches. Um, they just want to keep things in-house and work on themselves deep down, you know, there is the alternate universe. Like Evan said, maybe it looks very – the prop the prop could look very bad right now because of all the new people. They're learning a, learning a brand new defense. Um, they're going to have a new quarterback essentially. So maybe they are. They don't want the offseason um, negative hype train to get building. But I'm just trusting that they'll get coached up even more through the, the summer and then the fall, and they'll be okay. So we'll see. I have a pretty hotter take on this. Hotter than Evans? I don't think there are any benefits to not showing your spring game, for one. Um, also, if you're Michigan, you know, Michigan, the, the premier, a premier football program, you're going to be in the spotlight. You're going to have a hype train around you every single year. And this just kind of all goes back to is, is maybe Harbaugh and the way he coaches, are they just like not mentally tough? Like they can't handle any criticism. They don't want people to see their spring game. And if they're terrible, they don't want like their guys getting down because they had a bad spring. I mean, I just don't understand. Like if you have your spring game open, and I don't know if they could have had fans at that point or not, but like Michigan State had recruits come unofficially and you get exposure to your program and people get to see. And even if your spring game is a practice, like Evan said, there's no, like you don't have to show anything. You don't have to like worry about like schemes getting taken. You can just run the most simple things ever and you can make your fans happy. But if you're Michigan and you want to be in the category of the Ohio States and Alabamas and all those schools that they think they are close to, which they're not, that's another conversation, then I think you need to have a spring game. You need to show your your fans what they're paying for. And then ultimately, are they just like, is is Michigan football soft now? Is that what it is? Like, no. They give up in games. They shut down. If you think... Not putting your spring game on television is uh like I think it's your soft. program is soft. If you're hiding something, I think it's pretty soft. I think they're just going business like a page out of a Belichickian playbook. Let's just keep let's focus on us this offseason. Bama doesn't do that. Bama's 
a different program. Clemson doesn't do that. We're not in the same conversation as those teams. Well, then then the problem solves. But half the Michigan faithful thinks that they're there, and then no, the reasonable don't. fans think they're not. Half the fan base does not think they're Clemson, Alabama. The national media compares them to that group no, every single start of the year. No, they don't. Then why are they ranked in the top 10 almost every year? You can be in the top 10 but not be that group. Fine. That's a different group. <gasps> are they a top 10 group every year? Is Michigan? Is Are they a top 10 program right now? No. Okay, then we're done. But I think a lot of people think that. I don't. I think national media still think that. You think national media think that Michigan football is a top 10 program in college football entering this season? I'm not saying like this season they're going to be a top 10 football team. I'm saying their program in general is viewed as a top 10 college football program by national media. I don't think that's true. No, I do. I think that is severely... Uh, they have top 15 recruiting classes every year. They're ranked annually in the top 15 every year. I could see them easily being seen. There's a reason they get ranked that. There's a reason they're recruiting rankings like up that. until I mean up until the I would say up until 2019 from Harbaugh's 2015 2019. Yeah, they were they were a top ten team over, program over that top ten program over that stretch. But then the back half of 2019 when you got embarrassed by Ohio State again, and then you have 2020, you're no longer that. You got to get back into that. There's other teams around their eyes. So what? This is my last question. So what tier do you think they're in then, right now, ranking-wise? I view it, I, I, I'm not viewing nationally. I'm viewing Big Ten-wise. It's like there's Ohio State, and then there's Michigan, Michigan State, Penn State, and Wisconsin. And they're all in that. They're in that tier. They're Michigan just, State is not in that tier right now. Not but, right now. No. I mean right now. Not right now. I'm talking right now. Okay. So this season. Let's say 2019 to 2021. Where are you putting Michigan? Because that's when you said Michigan declined and they're no longer a top 10 program since the back half of 2019. So where are they right now nationally? Top 25 team program. Okay. Well, I think it's weird. Top 25 program is not showing their spring game. Yeah. I mean, also there's like, there's like the nitty gritty of it. It has to, they did their spring stuff earlier than everyone. And it also is up to big 10 network of like TV slots and contracts that are signed. I want to say I have zero problem with not showing it. I that's don't fine. care. And I'm just giving my opinion that I think I it's actually weird. found it refreshing. To and not I have to worry honestly about. think if if Michigan wanted their spring game televised by Big Ten Network, Big Ten Network would do it. So oh, I agree. That's not a great point. Um, the things that actually matter besides that, yeah, like semantics. Cade McNamara is a starting quarterback, and people should not be expecting like a massive freshman year from Don Edwards unless he really balls out. It is going to be Hassan Haskins and Blake Corum as a two man tandem. I would probably expect Haskins to get more of the load because I think they realize, based on attrition and also realizing last year's not strong running game, that it's better to spread out carries than um, just do just – or no, it's better to ride one guy that's better than just spread it out. So it's going to be mainly two guys. Okay, so if you say football, we already discussed a little bit about the spring, but Tuck is coming and the defense or like the rosters gonna look differently than the spring, completely different. And then for Michigan State basketball, Monty Bates decommitted, big national storyline. Massive. Um, he's showing interest from the pro level. Um, Michigan fans are getting giddy, thinking now he's gonna go to Michigan. Yes. Texas is drawing interest. Yes. Um, but I. Th- it hurts. You never want to see a player like that leave. Um, but I think the biggest, I want to issue a problem is now that the 2022 recruiting class, there's nobody in it. Where some mm-hmm. of these big programs that you're competing with already have one or two, and now you're filling more spots. You're not getting a guy to come, the number one player in the country, and maybe somebody wants to play with him, and so it's an easy add. Now the 2020. Two class has nobody, and the way the scholarships fill out for Michigan State basketball, you're filling like four or five spots, and that's a big recruiting class for basketball. Yikes! And now Michigan State's not used to it. We've added like a couple transfers over the years, but now you might be asking to fill the roster for the next two or three years with transfers, which you never like to see if you want like consistency in your program. You need all those transfers out to opt back in. Panic button? I don't know. 
maybe not. But Amani Bates decommitment to me was um, shocking in one way and not in the other. I was not stunned that he is really considering going pro, but I'm kind of stunned that it was a phrase as a decommitment and that he's open to other colleges. In my mind, it was, I'm going to be committed to MSU until the day I need to decide to go pro. And then I'm going to be, all right, I'm going pro instead. Uh, AKA Isaiah Todd, did to Michigan. And I'm no fault to a kid for doing that, but I didn't see a decommitment this early coming. And then like, Hey, Texas, um, According to Jeff Goodman, there's mutual interest with Texas, which means there's someone on the Bates camp too. That's stunning. Maybe he wants to actually try to be the next Kevin Durant and go to the same school as Kevin Durant. I don't know. But that was a school I did not see coming. And I would be very surprised if he plays in college still, um, especially at a school other than Michigan State. Do I think he'll come to Michigan? No, but it's a fun storyline. So I won't let it die yet. A monolith, Alex? I agree with Evan in the sense that you do not want to lose a player of his caliber. You don't want him to decommit, obviously. The next LeBron James. And yes, people are going to make a huge deal about it. It's a massive deal. And, you know, some people are going to create this false narrative that Michigan State is losing it and Tom Izzo can't recruit. I've seen it all plenty of times before. The only thing I'll say is Michigan State is Michigan State. They've never been Correct. built on five-star, <laughs> star basketball players. They've never been built on that. And they will still be just fine. The, the sky is not falling in East Lansing, as some journalists may say. So I'm not super worried. To Evan's point about the recruiting class, yes, now you have no one for 2022. But I've seen that uh, we've been a little more open about offering kids. I think we've offered a couple in the last week or two or actually like full scholarship offers out there. So I'm sure Michigan State will still bring in a couple kids, and then if they have to bring in a player or two from the transfer portal, I think they will be fine. I'm not. They had a three-man class this year, and I don't think any of them are going to be a one-and-done. Maybe Max Christie. So it's not – the sky is not falling in East Lansing for all the Michigan oh, State fans that might be scared. The sky is falling. You still have oh, time as though you, you're still a falling. top 10 program. Maybe Help. top seven, so it's not it's not a crisis. Middle of the Big Ten. Help. He's gonna. I think he was gonna go pro anyways. I never really expected him to come to campus. Michigan State football. Clavaris Crouch is a Spartan. Who, Did we ever talk? I don't about care that? about that. Who, well, he said transfers. Who is going to be the starting quarterback? As you feel now. As you show now. notes to quote it. Thorn is the guy right now. If and but. The door's open because Russo still has a lot to learn about the playbook and all that. But I think, based on what I saw, Thorne is the quarterback right now. Be a real thorn in my side if he beat Michigan again. No pun intended. <laughs> he didn't play against Michigan. But he was on a team. So Rocky again. He lost to the starting quarterback in Northern Illinois. Yeah, hey, he's a good player. Evan? <laughs> Just uh, gut, re- gut, gut feel. From what I have seen personally, uh, gut feeling, maybe a little more insight. Um... I would say Thorne is the leader right now. No Noah Kim. Sad. Played well. No. He's not there yet. It was practice. Anybody can show up for practice. Or get a good spring in general. Practice. Michigan basketball. Not a dumpster fire. Not losing top recruits. Not panic fest. No one's panicking. Well, they did lose Franz Wagner today, actually today. And that's no surprise. I was prepared for that. Was a little eyebrow raised why it took so long, but their season did go longer because they're awesome. You know, made it the Elite Eight, whatever, should have been the Final Four, but that's whatever. Different podcast. Um, so he finally took his time. Wrote, wrote, points. Wrote, a, wrote a nice, yeah. Well, under 50. Yeah. Well, Johnny Juzang will do that to you, I guess. Uh, he wrote a nice Players Tribune article, and I don't know. Good for him. So, but. I'm just like, there was just no surprise there. But addition, Devontae Jones. Finally, Michigan makes a splash in the transfer portal. Still one of the only schools that has had no one leave, which is stunning in today's age of basketball. So I watched this guy, um, so you don't have to, people that listen. This guy is a bucket getter. He has one of the grossest jump shots you'll ever see. So when you watch him shoot, just know that it's not pretty looking. So a lot of people, like Alex... Probably. I'm just guessing. We'll watch it and be like, oh, that guy stinks. He's wrong. He shot like 37% last year, so he's not an awful three-point shooter. It just looks like a push shot. Um, What he's going to hang his hat on is stellar defense. He had 2.8 steals per game, third most in the whole country. 
And a lot of his buckets were like tough trans like transition type layups off those steals. Um, and he makes a lot of really good like finisher around the rim. He's stout. He's not going to get bullied in the Big Ten, so I feel good about that. Like he's pretty pretty thick built point guard. Um, it's huge for the program. I think they needed another piece. He mid season he was averaging twenty points a game, so he can be volume guy. Um, at other times he's shown he can be the assist guy, which I think he'll have to be at Michigan. He's not going to be. He's going to have to fill in the Mike Smith role where. You're good at pick and rolls. They needed a pick and roll guy with Hunter Dickinson. Player comps. We did player comps earlier in the NFL draft. Now, I want to say he's going to be a lesser version of, right? Because the player I'm about to say is in the NBA right now. Devontae Jones could be in the NBA at some point. He's thinking about testing the waters. I see shades of Jalen Brunson in Devontae Jones. A crafty, thick point guard. Again, not going to be as good. Not as silky of a shooter. But... A guy that's going to be fundamentally sound, make tough layups, make good passes, play stellar defense. Um, and I watched Jalen Brunson play all of his years in the Big East as a Butler fan. And I would love to have a player like that on Michigan. The only downside I wrote, I'm a big Frankie Collins guy. We'll get to that as we get closer to the season. Frankie Collins is going to be a star. He just won a dunk contest. He can jump out the gym. He's a great point guard. This is going to slow his breakout he, like as a freshman a little bit because he's not going to be the backup point guard. But that's fine because Devontae Jones is the Sun Belt Player of the Year, and we welcome that. We welcome Players of the Year at Michigan. I speak on behalf of all of Michigan for that. You done? I don't know if you have, yeah. I don't know if you have anything about Devontae Jones. I do. So I remember when we talked about Tyson Walker, similar type of situation, point guard, lower tier conference, yep. coming over. And your big concern was competition level and all that. How many Power Five teams did Devontae Jones play this year? This year, if you had a guess. This year should not be counted. I'm not going to guess. I looked at his stats against big tier teams, and they already did all this research. But this year, I, I'll play your game. I don't know. And I also, probably not much, because it was a year of COVID where non-conference was not a big thing. Zero. He played yeah. zero power right. five pro. Because the Sun Belt was probably like, hey, you know what? Let's just play our conference so people don't die. He hasn't played a power five program since November 24th of 2019. Don't care. He was awesome. So you can do all your complaining about Tyson Walker and jump into the next level and oh, can he do it against you know big time competition? We really don't know if Devontae Jones can. We haven't seen it. I agree. I didn't say he's gonna be awesome. So my uh, my only like cautionary thing would be like, will it transition to the big time? I also wrote he is a good player. He can fill it up. He's a playmaker. And I think he can contribute. The only thing I wouldn't go Jalen Brunson far because you Tom. don't know. Comparison. But that seems poor man's. How about Mike Smith? Let's start at that. He's too hard to compare to that because Mike Smith is a better shooter. In terms of production, team help is taller. In terms of helping, it could be team. like that. Yeah. Is he going to be like the best player on Michigan next year? I wouldn't think so. No, Connor Dickinson is the best player on Michigan next year. I re- like that's no. Okay, I'm just saying proceed with caution. As you said to us about Tyson Walker, I'm saying I'm too. super excited. That Unless I'm you're full. shooting your shot and you think he's just going to be that guy. Yeah. He'll be better than Tyson Walker. Okay, we'll see. He may not mean as much to Michigan's team because they're going to be deeper, but like, because Tyson Walker could play like almost 40 minutes a game. I don't think that's crazy. Like, he could I play, so. he could play 32 plus a game. Jaden Atkins is going to play, I think. Oh, for sure. He'll play. But I think towards the end of the year, Tyson Walker might be playing like 32 plus minutes a game. I don't know if Don Jones will get that. He might. Mike Smith almost did. So, yeah. Devin, do you know anything about DJ from the Sun Belt? Uh, no. Fine if you don't. Um, you have it in the show notes. Um, did I skip over a little bit? Yes, because I didn't know who the player was. Fair. Um, I just looked him up, and the first picture I saw was not the best picture of Devontae Jones. And I thought, <laughs> who did Michigan just do? He I saw his stat line. And he's he was averaging old. more than 19 points. He's from the coast of Carolina. Go Shanties. Some Shanties. Belt player of the year, like you said. You know, I just, I have nothing really much to say, and we'll see. We will see. I don't think he's going to hurt Michigan, and I don't know how much he's going to greatly help, but I, a transfer I don't see. He would hurt you know, Jordan Howard's not going to go after some player that he doesn't think is going to compete for the team. Fully agreed. And as I was saying this earlier before the show, wild world we live in where Michigan and Michigan State are going to have two transfer players going at each other. And next year's matchup, which I don't think has really happened in my life. I don't know. I, I could easily be missing someone, but that's just a 
that's just the state of college basketball now. You gotta go get guys in the portal. So that's just that's an it's an interesting uh, matchup. Northeastern versus Coastal Carolina. Very basically. similar stats. Yeah, a lot of different body types. Yeah, I mean, I think I think one Jones is forty pounds on Tyson Walker. I think one, that's I think that's going to help him in the Big Ten. That's why I get a little bit more optimistic about it. What he's built for this league. We'll see. Big life, big it's stage, May. big Ben. It's May. We sleep in May in college basketball terms. Well, we're sleeping. It's gonna be May. <laughs> All right, let's get to, um, as we close this out, this uh, topic three. We had a listener question come in about the three teams in Detroit outside the Lions from Rich on Instagram. He basically asked, why is every Detroit team in last, like what has happened to Detroit sports? I think we'll briefly touch on all three. Um, Let's start start tires and we'll kind of be fast moving through. We don't want this to drag on forever. So kind of get down the points you wrote and we can piggyback off each other. To set the stage, Tigers are 8-21. and 21. Um, They have a minus 62 run differential. And the next worst team in the league of Pittsburgh Pirates is minus 28. So we are almost 40 runs worse than the next worst team in baseball, which is disgusting. Yeah, Tigers, guys. I mean, I think, I think we're all pressing the panic button. I don't know. Maybe Evan hasn't yet. I don't know. I am firmly pressing the panic button on this team. I knew the season wouldn't be good, but... Am I, are we way off? Am I way off? What are we thinking? The Tigers, the Detroit Tigers, are an absolute dumpster fire. There's nothing promising about the Tigers right now. They have uh, incompetency in the front office. You look at the trades they've made in the past when you're supposed to be rebuilding. You trade all these stars and you got nothing to show for it. Verlander, JD, Castellanos. Upton, Price. I mean, you could go. The list goes on. You, you don't have anything to show for that. Your number one prospect, Casey Mize, sorry, Evan, is not dazzling, as you could say. And right. your number one hitting prospect is in single A. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. There's just nothing to look forward to. And to answer that guy's question, why are the Tigers bad? I think it just is solely on the front office for the Tigers. Yeah. This is year five of a rebuild, and they're terrible. And yeah. I am close. Evan looks like he's distraught. What do you got? I'm distraught with the Casey Mines comment. One, <laughs> he's not getting any help offensively. And so he has to go up there and pitch like scoreless innings every single time he's out. And that's just, you can't ask for that. That would be a lot of pressure. Yeah. I agree. But he's not the team can't away. hit it. Yeah. The offense is so bad. The, the team has the probably the worst batting average. I didn't look this up. He has the batting average in Major League Baseball collectively. History. And yeah. like Alex said, this is the front office. One, one, you COVID. And so a bunch of teams cut their payroll in the Major League Baseball. So they don't have to spend so much this year. And the Lions didn't do, not the Lions, the Tires didn't do anything to help the roster this year. They signed a bunch of no names. Our big acquisition was Robbie Grossman, who can't hit. And the thing was, oh, he draws a bunch of walks. He gets on base. It's laughable. You can't get on base when he's striking out. And this is why do we stink so much? And this is like you said, this is from the trades and not getting talent in return. And the talent that we drafted when we were good was all about beefing up our arms, our bullpens. And so now you see the top of our rankings or prospects is mostly pitching. And that's not going to help. You would like that to be 50-50 in our young talent. They're going to hold them down into the minors to hold their options so they don't come up and play for another two years. Like, you'd be lucky to see Torkelson next year. Like, the full 162 games of next year. You'd be lucky to see him. Yeah. You'd be lucky to see Riley Green. Just it's just that way they can hold on to their, their contract and their, their options so you have them longer on your team. It's, it's dark. I think the biggest thing... The biggest thing that's disappointing is the offense. Because offense is, like, the pitching, sure, they're not. And to, to, to Mize's defense, stats-wise, he's had five starts, and two of them have been quality. So I can take that. I can live with that. We, we'll see improvement. His, I'm not saying he's going to be His, bad. like, nitty-gritty walks, hits stuff, not great. Command could be better. School Bowl has been more of a bad. He's had four, four starts, zero qualities. You don't love to see that. But, like, Boyd and Farmer have been, or um, Fulmer have been okay. So that's not the problem. The hitting. 7, 750 this is a stat I like for hitting OPS on base plus slugging. Helps a lot with, like, you know, just predicting how good offenses are. The average stat for that is uh, 750.750. We only have one hitter above that, and it's Badu. And that's just from, like, a one-week stretch he had because he hasn't done much since then. 
I think he, uh, like the league figured out he can't really hit inside pitches. So that's been hurting him. Yeah. I mean, there's just not a single offensive player on our team that I get excited to watch. And I think to Evan's point, that is why the pitchers are now feeling so much pressure and stuff. It's embarrassing. It is because there's been many teams in the MLB that have blown it up and rebuilt the Cubs, um, the Astros, all these people, and they did it faster than us. And we're five years in this, and nothing to show of it. So, I think that covers the tires. Yeah. I would love to say Al oh, needs to go. My only other thing I want to say is I really hope this like stretch doesn't count against A.J. Hinch and his staff, because I really think they would be the great, they would be the staff that could they can take us to the next level with the right talent. And I just don't want this to be held against them. And if you, like, I don't want Hinch to get canned because of like incompetence in the lineup. Like he can only do, he's not picking the players. He can't, he only do so much. I don't think the new GM that comes we in did. will get rid of him. But, and yes, this there should be a new GM. For sweeping the Astros. Yeah. Yeah. Things looked a lot different when we were sweeping the Astros. It's a disgrace. It's a disgrace to baseball. Um. Okay. Pistons quickly. There's some guys that we found this year, getting the end of the season, that I like, that I think are good. I think they should keep Frank Jackson. Sadiq has been awesome. Isaiah Stewart's been good. Killian, when I watch him play, he's a fantastic passer of the basketball. And if he's just solely that, I mean, maybe pick him a little too high, but like I'm good with that. And he plays good defense. His finishing around the rim needs to be better eventually. And like if they just get one more dominant score, I think they'll be okay. I'm just going to fire two quick takes. I think Troy Weaver is going to win executive of the year sometime here in the future. Nice. And if the Pistons get Suggs or Cunningham, I think they'll compete for a playoff spot next year. All right. Compete. All right. Rebuild is true. They're doing it right. They're competitive with a young core, um, but they're also one of the worst teams in basketball. However, I think the NBA is going to screw them over in the lottery. Oh, no. And we might miss out on one of the top picks. Conspiracy but we are flirting yeah. with the worst pick. And we might be like, hey, give it to the Pistons. Don't you remember the 2004 Pistons? Um, but I think Sidney Bay is going to be a future all-star, multi-year all-star within two years. Remember when I said he was the face of Detroit? Feels good. Did you say it? Wow. Credit to you for that. Yeah. Um, and then so for Rich, like why they're bad, I mean, they we brought in a GM to get rid of everyone. They had some Drummond, Griffin, bad contracts. But you can be hopeful about this as opposed to the Tigers. Like, this is trending up. We're looking good here. A lot hinges on the lottery, but we're looking up. Pistons are looking great. I feel very good about them. And the reason they sucked, and now suck still, but going to be good, is solely because of Stan Van Gundy. I was going to say the owner a little bit, but I don't want to bash him because he's still the owner. But Stan Van Gundy, for sure, is the problem. Was the problem. And he's and the Pelicans fans already don't like him down there. So yeah, he's, yeah. You can't have a GM coach. It doesn't. Work but his build that wall quote was legendary. They didn't win a playoff game. Oh, no, it was like form a wall. Yeah. Anyways, a team that I'm now in the middle on. So the tires are like despair. Pistons are like super hopeful. I would say I'm about middle of the pack on the Red Wings. Um, looking at the standings as I did earlier with Evan, we're like the eighth worst team in the NHL. So, improvement. are we getting better or are teams just sucking more? Um, are we in a better trajectory than the Tigers is my main question. My quick answer is yes. No, we are. Competent GM. Okay. Something the Tigers don't have right now. Okay. Our team is getting better. Throughout the year, we've gotten better like statistically competing more, um, scoring more, playing a little bit better defense. And there's a couple stats that I saw recently. The Red Wings are undefeated if they score four plus more goals. Okay. And if they it score like three or more goals, they're 16 and two. Whoa. And Red Wings fans have been saying this for a while. It's it's the defense and it's slowly improving, but it's not there yet. We still have a young prospect in Sedair in the minors playing overseas. Um, and then our two goalies are now, uh, Greece and Brainier are now both in the top 25 in save percentage. In the National Hockey League. So there's always been rumor how we need save percentage is a big deal, Alex. No, it's I know that. Loss, but the top the 25 well is like, yeah. there's like 30 teams, 32 teams. So, like, if you're 25th, yeah, but that's not sometimes, crazy. but sometimes teams play multiple goalies and some goalies are like most suitable for injuries. 
Right. But I know two. save percentages. But you have two no goalies. Doubt. You have two goalies in the top 25. That's nice. Two. So two That's of our good. goalies better than some team's number one goalies. Right. It's an important stat if you're a hot nut. Okay. Just, hey. just get it. Just no one's disagreeing. I agree. It's an important stat. I never was questioning that. I was questioning the top 25. I felt like that was a big range. That's all. Not chopping the stat. Believe in the stat. Next, we got Vrana, and it is an absolute steal. We stole him from the Capitals, and like you can have Mantha. Like, I already forgot about that Mantha played for us because I won Shut Vrana, up. and I want him to sign like an extension today. Did you see his short uh, his shootout goal? Well, we tweeted it. That was Pavel Datsuk-esque. It was like miniature Datsuk doing that. And so the future's looking bright. We have two first-round picks next year. Iserman knows what he's doing. Iserman knows what kind of guys he likes. And I wouldn't be shocked if this rebuild happens sooner than people were expecting, just based off of how well we performed this end of the second half. And some key pieces that are going to be eventually getting into the fold next year. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so Vrana, stat-wise, I was looking up nine games with us, seven points, six goals, one assist. That's pretty awesome. It's rock solid. Six goals, nine games. Oof. So he looks good. That's a great start. I mean, I have a group of three players that concern me, some more than others. And I was, like, going back. Obviously, it's, like, too high of a standard. I was going back to the last cup-winning team of the Red Wings and seeing, like, what their point production. And, again, this season is different because – and last year, because of COVID, there was less games. And this year, they're playing less games. So it's hard to map out the points. But just looking through the careers, like obviously the young guys that are playing right now for the for the Red Wings on offense, because we've talked about like it seems like defense is looking okay and our goalies are looking okay, but we're gonna need three plus goals. We need we need to hit three goals a night. We need to be like shooting for three goals. I get concerned. One, um, I I don't know if Larkin is like the guy. The guy I don't know. Like I could see us being like great when we get some more young offensive talent and maybe he's like the, the KG veteran to coach them up and still has skill, like when he's in his 30s, like that might be when we hit our run. But I don't know like if he's like a 90 point per season guy because I look at like Dotsuk having 90 points, Zetterberg having 90 point seasons. Like I don't know if I, I, I see that yet. Maybe it'll come later. And then, and obviously he just had an upper body injury. So he's got to work through that. He's done for the season. So you got to get him healthy. And then I was looking again, you forget about him, but I like Tyler Bertuzzi a lot, but he only played a handful of games because he got hurt. So you kind of need him to be that second guy on the line. I worry about him sometimes. They're still both young. And the last one, I think he was the sixth pick in the draft, Flip Zadina, only a couple of seasons, one or two. His point production this year has not been good. So I, I worry about those three guys. Like I'm almost seeing like, are they going to be like our star second line when we bring in even more offensive talent? Like Lucas Raymond makes the show and he's like the dazzle guy on the front line. Like I don't, when are we going to get our guy, our guy, our guy, or is it Larkin? I need to readjust. I don't know. The lottery screwed the Red Wings a few times out of that guy. So, you know, but what do you think, Evan? Um, I would say Larkin's probably always going to be like that first liner, Mm -hmm. um, the center for the first line. Um, will his point production increase? I would say yes. One, as soon as you get a better team around him, the point is it going to go up. When we get but two I don't know if he really goes. will average 90 points. Just solely based he, – his he's not the flashy goal scorer. Um, he's more of a speed guy mm-hmm. to where he, he just game it a different way rather than screwing the puck in the back of the net. Um, and then Zadina, I think he's still raw. He still struggles handling the puck in, when he gets pressure on him. But I feel like if you could get, like everyone's going to say, you put better people around him, I think he can be a goal scorer where he has a natural instinct of actually scoring. And he, that's what we drafted him for was scoring. And then Bertuzzi, he's our one line right now. And I do like him. I do like his skill set. I do like the way he plays. But he's probably like a second or third line guy if you really think about like having like a perfect team. I see him as like a second or third line guy. And if he's, a th- if he's on our third line, then – the Red Wings are probably going somewhere in the playoffs. Yeah, I like that. I like readjusting. Because I'm trying to think when we get good, how is this going to shake out? So it sounds like based on that and my lack of knowledge, we just need to surround Dylan Larkin on the front line with two like really good goal-hungry wings that will take care of that, and he can just set them up with his speed and playmaking. Like, yes. Vrana, like a Verona and like a Lucas Raymond. Um, sounds great on paper. You know? Sure. Raymond's a wing, right? Or is yes, he, he is. Okay, yeah. He's, He's a little like, undersized. Um, plays bigger than he is, but he is a puck scorer. And then obviously you can see from Verona, he's a 
goal scorer. And then the got the Germany guy, uh, like Cider. They always talk about him. Like they blow him up. He could be the next Lidstrom. Not that good, but like we just need a guy on defense, and then we're going, we're going places. A lot of big time comparisons. Well, in the well, we've talked about last of we have multiple draft picks. Our cap is going to increase because we're losing some contracts to the old guys, and so I wouldn't be shocked. There's not that many big free agents out there. I wouldn't be shocked if the Red Wings try to do something in free agency when we have we've been a little bit quiet in the past couple of years. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if we try to actually draw in free agents now. I like that. Or if you're the Tigers, you just sign Robbie Grossman and hope he becomes Barry Bonds. It'd be nice if the Tigers <laughs> trusted their pitching enough to go make some of those acquisitions this offseason. Or any acquisitions. That'd be a good start. Um, so I guess lastly, because real quick, I just spaced out. We hit the Red Wings. We hit them all. Um, listener question from Ben on Twitter. I'll just pick one. Do you guys... Hmm. All right. Does Al, Alex Avila survive the year as GM? His name is not Alex, I don't think. Al. I think it's just Al. Okay. And I think he will survive the year because of the ownership of the Detroit Tigers and their lack of desire to win. Yes, he's surviving this year, and he's probably going to survive next year too because the Illiches are losing interest in having any interest in manufacturing a quality team for the Tigers. They also just have other plans with their other company, their big industry, and so they have other interests, and they don't really care about the Tigers anymore. We are on the same page there. I would like to think, I could be naive thinking, I'd like to think he doesn't if it goes as bad as it's on track to go, like 8-21, and 21, and I think Hinch cares so much about the team and the guys care about the team. I think there'll just be so much like tension in the, in the organization that it might be a force-your-hand move. I mean, if they're really losing, like, 120-ish games, it's going to be dark. And I think that something will have to be done drastically. And I think he's the, he'd be the, he'd be the um, person to go. I really think the ownership doesn't care. They're, that's what they're showing. That's what they've showed for five years. They, they, they do not care. So, well, take me back to the Mike Illich days when we were just dropping bags on players. Even though we didn't end up he winning cared. anything, that was fun. He cared. He wanted to win. He did whatever he could. He was not afraid to go over the luxury tax, which you basically have to do unless you're the Tampa Bay Rays in baseball to be good. I mean, every team that's good ha- is over the luxury tax. Because we don't – they don't. baseball is that weird sport that doesn't really have a salary cap. You can spend as much as you want. You just have to pay more taxes. If Leland was still there and not Osmus, then maybe they would have won a World Series. You know? Maybe. They had the talent to do it. Yeah. If anybody besides Osmus is managing that team in 2014, yeah, we get past the Orioles. That's that's 100 fact. I hate to end nobody the show. on the team liked Osmus. No, he was so young. I I hate to end the show on that that devastating note of losing to the Orioles. It still haunts me to this day. But that's how we're going to close it out. It's just kind of a nice stamp. Last time they were relevant, the last stamp of Detroit sports right now. But we think three of the four are on the rise. So, um, Rich, if that helps you sleep better at night. Three of the four are looking good. There's, we can see a plan. There's a plan being laid. Um, but as always, follow our social accounts at Shot of MS on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Shot of Michigan Sports on TikTok, Shot of Michigan Sports at gmail.com on uh, our email. Those places, socials are good for any clips, the video segments you want to see, uh, comments, likes, DMs, questions you want to ask. Email is good for questions as well as any business things you want to ask about. And then wherever you're listening to this, YouTube, Spotify, or Apple, we'd appreciate, depending on the platform, to give it a like, um, five-star rating, a review, and subscribe if you're on YouTube. And also, podcast, you can subscribe. So it downloads right away. Share, share the link with a friend is always helpful. Word of mouth is a great way to sh- um, share the podcast if you'd like to. And uh, that's pretty much it. As always, submit any questions you want. We will do our best to answer them like we did here. And then with that being said, we will cheers, close it out to episode 19. Cheers to uh, three of the four teams' futures. All right. Cheers.